Father in heaven, we are so grateful to you for your son, Jesus Christ, Lord, and for, uh, and for the revelation that you have given through him, O oh Lord. Through him, we could understand you, we could know you, and in fact, we could get in contact and touch with you, O oh Lord. Thank you very much for re revealing yourself through your son, O oh God. As we are going to meditate on your word, Lord, I pray your spirit's leading and guidance given to us. And we ask you to open our hearts and minds so that we may be able to perceive and receive the revelation you give to us as we discuss your, your word of God. Through everything we do, your name be exalted. Our discussions may mutually encourage us and uh, our discussions, Lord, may be acceptable in your sight. Give us the wisdom and knowledge and utterance, and especially your spirit's uh, guidance to us. We submit this time to the throne of grace, asking for your mercies. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Um, the, if, you go, if you want a title for today's message, uh, like I put on the post, can be the following. It is, if it is not the law, what are Christians obligated to? And obviously, this is going to be a study from the book of Galatians, chapter 5, specifically verses 13 to 26. So we have studied, or we are studying, uh, the obligations of a Christian. Let's do a recap from the last session, and then we will carry on uh, with the rest of uh, the chapter of Galatians, chapter 5. Last time we discussed that when the, according to the Apostle Paul, when somebody signs up to a practice, a ritual which was prescribed under the law, the law as given by Moses, if you sign up to, let's say, the practice of circumcision, uh, it means that you are actually signing up to the entire law. I think we made it fairly clear last time that if you keep one law, insist on keeping one of the laws, then automatically the entire law is attractive. If one law is broken, then the whole law is broken. So the Apostle Paul, I think, makes it clear. The choice is clear. What's the choice? He uh, uh, in, 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 you know, very clearly in those verses, he says, it is either Christ or circumcision, or it is either Christ or the law, because circumcision is, you know, uh, equated to the law. If it is the law, then Paul says Christ profits you nothing, because in his understanding, and the way he teaches these uh, uh, Christians in Galatia, it cannot be Christ plus circumcision, or it cannot be Christ plus law. Why? Because you cannot add anything to Christ. Christ is not deficient. Christ's work is not deficient. Christ is not incomplete in what he has done for us. Jesus Christ from the cross said, it is finished. In other words, he very clearly says the job is done. So uh, we concluded by saying that Christ does not save us partly and that we have to do the rest. Uh, Christ is not a part-time savior. Right? And so Paul declares, and I'm reading from Galatians chapter 5 and verse 13, he says, you, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free. And we will look at that a little bit more closely as we go along. You were called to be free. Free from what? In verse 18, he makes it clear. You are not under the law. So the freedom is from the ritualistic approach to a relationship with God. He says, that is obsolete. Now, 
our relationship to God is governed by Christ in the Holy Spirit. All right, so that he makes that clear as we, and we will see it as we go along. So if you're not under the law, then you're also not under its penalty. Right. Now comes the, <laughs> the, the, the that, that question that we, you know, uh, always seem to be a nagging question that remains. And that is, does it mean that we can live any way which we like? Does it mean we have no standards? That it, does it mean that you and I can do anything we like and there is no uh, penalty or condemnation or consequence to the way we live? And that is where I would like to carry on from verse 13 onwards. And I think it'll be good for us to just read that the text, entire text from verse 13. So I'll bring it up on the screen at this time. And uh, let me read it so that we can just understand, you know, how Paul is beginning to show its, uh, you know, show his perspective on this entire subject. Uh, I'm presuming you can see the words on the screen. Uh, I, I'll just try to make it just a little bigger if it is hopefully helpful. Let me read through verse 13 onwards. Paul says, you, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. For the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. If you bite and devour each other, watch out or you will be destroyed by each other. So I say, verse 16, walk by the spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the spirit and the spirit is what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other so that you are not to do whatever you want, but if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. Okay. Verse 19. The acts of the flesh are obvious sexual immorality, impurity and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, orgies and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. Verse 22, but the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such, against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live by the spirit, let us keep in step with the spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking and envying each other. Okay, so I'll uh, come back to the original screen. So that is what the how the Apostle Paul describes, talks about the obligations of a Christian. Now, uh, I think it's very, very clear if I can pick up a few thoughts from there. And uh, obviously I don't have the time to do an entire exegesis of this, but we'll pick up a few thoughts and remain focused on what we are uh, talking about, the obligations of a Christian. So he says, you are not allowed to do whatever you want. Okay. And in verse 13, he says very clearly, do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Yes, we have freedom. We live in the freedom that Christ has ushered in, in, and we call it the new covenant. But your freedom should not be misused or your freedom should not be abused. Uh, and how do we abuse it? If we indulge the flesh, right? So it's very clear that uh, there is no permission to live as, as we like. Then, of course, what is the yardstick? Uh, what is the standard we live by? Is there a standard that the Apostle Paul uh, prescribes? To answer that question, 
I will uh, just bring in two specific thoughts uh, just to lay a foundation on which we can discuss this. Uh, obviously, the context here is the entire Bible. Uh, you know, I mean, there is so much we can bring in in terms of context, but obviously, we uh, wouldn't have the time to do that. So, uh, let's look at two foundational perspectives which will lay the context for our discussion this evening. Um, to understand what Paul is saying, to understand the question that I asked, what is our yardstick? What is the standard by which we as Christ, I mean, we as Christians live by? We need to understand the very, you know, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the, uh, what salvation is all about. Remember, last time we discussed what saves us, and we clearly said it's not the law, it is Christ. But what is this saving? What is salvation? Now, the Bible uses many ways to express salvation. But I want to use what Christ uh, referred to or how Christ described it. Um, salvation or eternal life, you know, various ways that you can describe it. Uh, the abundant life or the redeemed life, being saved, rescued, all of these words are used in the scriptures. Right? All of this is a relational union, right? So I want to describe salvation as a relational union. And I deliberately use those two words because, uh, uh, you know, the way Christ explains it, I think brings, it, brings this out a bit clearly. And I want to go to the book of, uh, uh, I want to go to the book of uh, uh, John chapter 17, just read you a few verses from there, where Jesus makes the very purpose of life fairly clear. He, uh, uh, this, you, you could say he is defining what salvation ultimately is, right? So, and I want to just focus on a few words which makes uh, this, uh, this concept clear. John 17, verse uh, 20 onwards, Jesus gives the ultimate purpose of life. He says, my prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message. That all of them may be one. Notice one. They may be one. So there is a relationship that he is describing. There is a, a collect, the, uh, 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 you know, all of them becoming one. So there is a relationship there. But notice he also goes on to say, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. So may they be one just as you are in me, I am in you. Notice the union. So there is a relationship being described uh, of oneness. And there is also a union a, uh, uh, as you are in me and I am in you. Continuing to read. May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. They may also be in us. Once again, uh, there is a union being described there. Verse 22, I have given them the glory that you gave me that they may be one as we are one. I in them and you in me so that they may be brought to complete unity. Did you notice how Christ is explaining our ultimate purpose of life is one day to be one and one in, in Jesus. And if we are in Jesus, then we are in the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, just because Jesus is in the Father, right? So there is that uh, sense of union being described and also a relationship. So the purpose of life Salvation, you could say, is relational, leading to a union, right? And it's a union enhancing the quality of the relationship. In other words, it is reciprocal. The union brings about a relationship, and the relationship uh, 
or I should say the relationship brings about the union and the union in, continues to improve the relationship. Right? So it's reciprocal, it's mutual, and it's communion. Uh, then the word communion makes a lot of sense when we bring this perspective. So what I want to really say is that our salvation is not just a relationship where we stand independent of our triune God. We are, we are sort of standing outside and having a relationship with God. It's not just that. Neither is it just a union where you lose your identity and you have no independent expression. It's neither. It is both. It's mutual. It is inclusive. Right, it is. Uh, it's 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 a type of perichoresis. You know, this is the word we have used on many a occasion uh, to describe the relationship within the uh, the triune uh, you know, reality between Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Uh, it is basically a relationship that arises out of a union, and a union that strengthens the quality of the relationship. I want to leave you with those thoughts, and if you have any you know, comment or question on it, we can discuss it later. But I feel that is very important for us to, uh, for us to understand how we must live our lives, okay? That is one point. Second point I want to just uh, uh, pick up from the text itself, Galatians chapter uh, five, where he talks about the flesh. Remember in verse 13, he says, do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. What is this flesh? And I think it will be helpful for us just to recognize what it means, and then we will bring what Paul says subsequently. The word flesh in the Greek, in the Greek is S-A-R-X, sarks. I don't know how would that, would that be a, 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 a pronunciation, uh, probably uh, close to it. So this flesh that Paul talks about that we should not indulge in is some translations, trans, uh, you know, uh, say it as sinful nature, right? But what I want to us to understand is that it refers more than just the physical. Many a times when we talk about flesh, we are only, uh, you know, sort of, uh, uh, we only think of the physical, but no. Uh, it is actually referring to all the faculties of being human. So <clears throat> it is certainly includes the physical, but it also includes the mental, psychological. It includes the spiritual. It includes the relation. And it's interesting how the Apostle Paul talks about human beings as body, soul, spirit, which is, uh, you know, he talks about that in the book of Thessalonians. But the flesh is a reference to the whole being, the entire person, uh, all the faculties that make us human beings. And what happened to us as human beings made in the image of God, right? What happened to us in the fall? This being of us, this entire being became sinful, right? This human nature became sinful, or you could say a corruption set in, and the corruption is in the whole person, right? It is in the entire person. So when the Apostle Paul talks about indulging the flesh, he says, do not indulge the flesh. What he is basically saying is, don't misuse the faculties of you being a human, you know, a human. Uh, it is the misuse of all the faculties that makes us human. And that's the reason why I would like you to uh, once again recall what I read in verse 19 onwards. Notice he says, the acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity. And I, I, let me just go through that list. Notice that list, how it describes that, uh, that whole person, right? Sexual immor immorality, impurity, debauchery idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. <laughs> that, that, that word, uh, we, we must not uh, miss out on those, uh, that, those uh, cluster of words, and the like. 
And then he goes on to give this warning. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live in this, uh, live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. Notice how inclusive the Apostle Paul is. You could say it's inclusive of the body, soul, spirit. It's the physical, the mental, the psychological, the spiritual, the relation, right? What Paul wants to perhaps convey through this description is that the law does not address, the law as given through Moses does not address all of these components. It addresses some, but the law basically gives us a knowledge of something that has gone wrong. But it does not address the entire thing. And notice, you remember the words and the like. In other words, it doesn't stop with this list. The, the indulgence of the flesh or the reference to the flesh is many, many more and much, much more. Uh, so what does Paul say? We need something more than the law to address the flesh. So when he talks about the flesh, he is saying the law is not helpful at all here, right? What do we need? Well, you know, to put it very succinctly, succinctly we need a perfect savior to put the flesh right. That is why we have the incarnation. We have God in the flesh. He put things right in the flesh. We didn't need a law to put the flesh right. We needed a savior in the flesh to put the flesh right. Now do you see that it is not the law that saves us. It is God incarnate that saves us. And I'm, I'm, I believe that the apostle Paul was, that was the intention with which he mentioned all of these things. So let's go back then to the question that we are specifically asking. What are Christians obligated to? What is the standard for Christians? If it is not the law, what is the yardstick? All right. Let me go back and read verse 13 again. Do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. For the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. Now, he is bringing one aspect of the great command, you know, love God with all your heart, soul, and mind. Love your neighbor as yourself. Don't forget, Jesus Christ also gave us a new command. And what is the new command? Love one another as I have loved you. What is the common denominator in all of this? What is the common denominator in the great command and the new command? Love, right? Love. Uh, and why is love the essential ingredient in this discussion? Now, recall what I, what I mentioned about salvation, right? And how Jesus Christ described it. Salvation is a relational union. And Salvation basically is love-based, right? The dynamic that facilitates a relational union is love. God is love. So you need God to solve the problem, not a written code. Our salvation is achieved in the spirit as achieved by Jesus in the spirit, is love-based, it is love-expressed, it is immersed by and in love. And so the Apostle Paul says, if you want a yardstick, if you want a, uh, you know, uh, uh, something to go by in terms of how you must live, he's saying it's love. And how is this possible? How is this ever going to be possible? Well, he says in verse 16, so I say, walk by the spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Right? You will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Walk by the, 
Walk by the spirit, the apostle says. He doesn't say walk by the law or the law of Moses. We need a union in the spirit to achieve this relational union, you know, or you could say this relationship. It's a union with the spirit that requires that achieves this relationship. That is why I use salvation as a relational union. You cannot remove the two out from each other. You have to have a relationship. You have, but to have a relationship, you must have a union. So in verse 18, then the apostle says, if you are led by the spirit, you are no more under the law. You are not under the law. Right? Okay. So uh, if you go back to how he describes the flesh, do not indulge the flesh, and you look at that long list, do you notice so many things there that are so relational? I mean, uh, uh, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, envy, uh, you know, uh, they are all relational. Even sexual immorality, in one sense, is relational. It, of course, it indulges the flesh, literally, but it also has a relational component to it. And that's the reason why we are beginning to see that the, and the, the entire obligation a Christian has is fundamentally relational. And that is possible only with a union in Christ, in the spirit. That's why we need the Holy Spirit. And that's why Jesus sent the Holy Spirit for us. Right? So then how does he describe the the how a Christian then begins to live his life. How does he put it? I'm, and I'm, 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 I'm once again, I'm picking up these verses from the text, verse 22. But the fruit of the spirit, why does he say the fruit of the spirit? Because he already said, walk by the spirit, right? So, and, and he says, let be led by the spirit. And if you are walking by the spirit and being led by the spirit, then the fruit of the spirit is love. And as I would like to add, Expressed in joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. I'm sure you all are very familiar with all of that entire list, right? The fruit of the spirit. And then he also says, against such things, there is no law. We'll, we'll just explain that a little bit. Notice the fruit again. The fruit of the spirit is love and it is expressed in all of these wonderful attributes, you know, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness. Do you see how, how each one of those are relational, right? Uh, fruit of the spirit is peace, has a relational component. It has a connection with, with yes, yourself. You need peace within yourself, but also with others. Forbearance is has a relational component. Kindness cannot, cannot be expressed without, uh, you know, a uh, to, to somebody to express it to. Goodness, a sense of goodness in you, which benefits others and blesses others. Faithfulness is very powerfully relational. Gentleness has to be expressed, you know, uh, with others. Self-control is also something that uh, benefits others when you are self-controlled and others are self-controlled. There is a sense of peace and all of these things put together brings us sense of joy. So the entire, you know, uh, fruit of the spirit, because we are walking by the spirit and the spirit is love, uh, we begin to see how these, uh, how all of this is a relational union in the spirit. And, and that is how a Christian lives. That is what a Christian is obligated to. Notice he says in, in the, uh, the last part of verse 22, against such things, there is no law. What, uh, what, what does Paul mean? And uh, we, there are various ways of looking at it. What does he mean by saying against such things, there is no law? Uh, one way of understanding that is that there is no law that can be voluminous enough to contain 
all of these attributes or behaviors that is governed by the spirit, that the spirit generates in us. There is no law that can be prescribed that generates all of these attributes, right? So what, what maybe what it means is the experience of freedom. Remember, we have freedom from the law, the written code. We experience your freedom, freedom where we can enjoy all of these attributes and many, many more. A written code cannot encompass the entirety of the spirit and what the spirit accomplishes in us because it cannot en encompass Jesus Christ. It en cannot encompass God, right? That's why the written code is limited, extremely limited. We need to go much, much beyond the law as it is written and given by Moses. So perhaps... When he says against such thing, there is no law, he is basically also perhaps means that no law can produce them. No law can produce all of these attributes. They cannot be produced by self-effort uh, uh, or attempts to keep the law. None of these things are possible by the law as written in the, you know, in the old covenant. It is, in other words, it's internally produced by the indwelling of the spirit. So you need, you could say an internal law, obviously, which is a reference to a, a new heart guided by the spirit or in union with the spirit. One translation says, uh, uh, translates it this way. There is no law which speaks against people who live this way, right? So that these are various ways to understand that particular sentence. So, what we can conclude is that the law does not deal with most of these things, but the spirit does. When we are led by God, we go beyond the law, uh, you know, uh, written code. It uh, goes to the very essence of the law, which once again, I hope you by now, uh, uh, you know, understand is love. In other words, the law is too low a bar for Christians. We need to, we need, uh, you know, to walk by the spirit. This is what, you know, if I can bring a connection to what Jesus was saying to the Pharisees at one time, I think this is Matthew 23. I'd like to read that verse for you. This is what Jesus, when Jesus referred to as the weightier matters of the law. You remember that? He talks about the weightier matters of the law. Let me read you Matthew 23, 23. It says, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. For you tithe mint and dill and cumin and have neglected the weightier matters of the law. Justice, mercy, and faithfulness. These you ought to have done without neglecting the others. Now, once again, I'm not exegeting this. Uh, some people take this and say, oh, you look at that. You shouldn't neglect the others. Well, uh, we need to look at it in context. I don't have the time to do that today. But uh, it's very interesting. Jesus brings this up with the Pharisees when he was trying to help them understand that their obsession to the law, their obsession to circumcision and all of the rituals was completely misplaced. They were missing the big point. They were, they were straining a gnat, as he says, and swallowing a camel. They were missing the entire point, right? The law points to something more important, much higher and primary than a written code. And notice how he describes the weightier matters of the law, justice, mercy, faithfulness. And if uh, you're not tired of hearing this again, they are all relational. <laughs> it's a relation, it is relational in nature, justice, mercy, faithfulness. Notice they are all relational. So Jesus, is showing that the written code is, is falls far behind the real essence, the weightier matters, the primary essence of the law, which is a relational union with God. So let's answer the question. I was hoping that I could, you know, give, give enough time for discussion. Uh, what are Christians obligated to? That is the question that uh, I am focusing on because Remember, uh, 
these verses have many more things to say, but I am, uh, you know, not going to dwell on any of those. So what are Christians obligated to? Verse 24, let me pick it up from the text again, Galatians 5. Those who belong to Jesus, those who belong to Christ Jesus, if you are a Christian, you have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Right? So that is one powerful, important aspect of Christian living, to crucify the flesh. And I hope that we have discussed that flesh aspect quite well uh, earlier. Verse 25, he goes on to say, since we live by the spirit, let us keep in step with the spirit. He doesn't say, since we live by the law, or he doesn't say, since we live by the law and the spirit. No, he says, since we live by the spirit, let us keep in step with the spirit. Let us not be conceited, provoking and envying each other. So Christian obligation, crucify the flesh. Done completely in Jesus, and we can appropriate that righteousness that Jesus Christ accomplished for us in the flesh, because we are going to fall short. We are going to try our best to crucify the flesh, and remember, the flesh is the entirety of the whole being uh, 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 that 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 we are as a human. But we fall short, and that is where Christ has accomplished something that we could never have accomplished in our own flesh. And so Paul says, as you crucify the flesh, live by the spirit. How? Why? I mean, what, what does it mean? God is love. So basically, he's basically saying, if you are going to be united with the spirit, then you have to live manifesting love, which the fruits we already have discussed. And he says, keep in step with the spirit, continue in the spirit. In other words, keep in step, every step of yours. Notice, I mean to say, make sure that you are walking in the spirit. Don't revert back, in other words, to circumcision and all of the rituals that the law talks about. Don't go reverting back, thinking that is important or that is required. No. And that's where the, uh, the Christians in Galatia was making a mistake. And in verse 26, and this is the completion of the uh, of that text. Uh, he says, let us not become conceited, provoking and envying each other. Once again, notice provoking, conceited, envying is against love, which is against relation, relationship, which is against the union in the spirit. So we as Christians, we are not to indulge in the flesh. Uh, and this is no longer defined by the law of Moses. Paul does not use the law of Moses to define this. Rather, it is defined by the person, the life, the teachings, and the character of a man called Jesus Christ. He is the last word to the problem of sin, not the law. He, Jesus Christ our Lord, is the last word to the problem of sin. And so I just uh, read a verse from Romans just to uh, uh, complement what uh, Galatians has been saying. Romans chapter 7, verse 4 and 6, I will read. So my brothers and sisters, Paul, said, Paul says, you also died to the law through the body of Christ, that you might belong to, uh, that you might belong to another, to him who has raised from the dead, in order that we might bear fruit for God. So we are dead to the law because Christ has died, right? Uh, and now we belong to him. We don't belong to the law anymore. And we bear much fruit to God in him, in the spirit. Verse 6 says, by now, but now by dying to what once bound us, what is it what that bound us? He goes on to say, we have been released from the law. We have been released from the law. So that we serve in the new way of the spirit and not in the old way of the written code. Do you want anything more to be more explicit? Brethren, as Jesus lay dying on the cross, this is what he said. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Connect that 
to what Christ's command is, you know, earlier to his disciples, where he says, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. You want a standard? You want a law? Here is one. Love your enemies. That is the new covenant. That is the law in a nutshell that Christians are obligated to. Okay, I'm going to stop there. And uh, let's get back into a discussion now. Yes, Surya Murthy, go ahead. You are reading the verses which say that if we do not have these attributes, you will not see the kingdom of God. Yeah. So what's the question? Or, or is it a question or is it just a comment? I don't know. No, I'll come to the question. The question okay. is, you may have faith in Jesus Christ. You may accept him as your savior. And if you do not have these attributes, you will lose the salvation. You can lose the salvation. Okay. Am I correct? Uh, let me ask you a question. <laughs> I'm answering a question with a question. Uh, you are referring to uh, the, you know, those uh, the indulging in the flesh, right? And that's where the kingdom part comes in, right? Where it talks about sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissension, faction, envious, envious uh, being, you know, and all of those. Tell me something. Can you tell me anyone who perfectly? No. So that means nobody's going to be in the kingdom. What am I? <laughs> no. I'm sticking to the logic here. <laughs> yeah. What I'm trying to say is this. First chapter of Second Peter. No, let me answer this question. Let me answer this question. You said faith in Christ is not enough. <laughs> that is exactly what we want to say. It is only faith in Christ because I cannot be perfect. You see, it is Christ in the flesh who did this perfectly for me. Now, that does not absolve me from not doing it, but I can't do it perfectly. And hence... It is Christ who saves me because I, I am united in his flesh, you know, uh, to, be able to, uh, to be able to live that righteous life. So the faith in Christ is paramount. So I, though I fail, though I fall short, it's, faith, it's my faith in Christ that will save me. Now, if I deliberately reject the faith in Christ and go and live, in the way that this is describing, obviously, then I've rejected faith, uh, Christ, and I have no salvation if I've rejected Christ. In the first chapter of Second Peter, that also lists some good attributes. And after the same, the good attributes, it says, if you don't have these good attributes, your faith in Christ is in vain. So yes. these two are similar. Yes, but once again, how easy it is to take that, you know, misinterpret that. Your faith in Christ is vain. Why? Because you have rejected Christ. You don't believe in Christ. You don't trust Christ. That is what it is basically trying to say. If you are trying to do all of this in your own strength, you are, the, you are most miserable. <laughs> That's what the Apostle Paul says. Because there is not a moment that, you know, where I can claim to keep this law perfectly or to keep or, or to, in, to uh, uh, not to indulge in the flesh perfectly. I can't do it. I mean, every day as I drive, I'm breaking the law. Every time I cross that white line or yellow line, wherever you are, uh, I'm breaking the law. I'm breaking the law constantly. But am I doing it deliberately? I mean, it's, it's the weakness in me. What can I do? Uh, that's where the Apostle Paul himself says, 
Thank God in Jesus Christ we have salvation. So Christ and faith in Christ becomes absolutely important. Any other, any other, uh, anybody else can contribute to that question? Please feel free to uh, bring in a perspective there. Yes, Anil, go ahead. I guess, uh, I think what Suryamurthy is saying that all these good works that, you know, Second Peter and these other verses, they're saying that unless you do that, you, you know, you might lose out. Uh, two observations. One is that, yes, you can't do all these things without Jesus Christ. I mean, he has done it for you and you and, but your faith in Christ must translate into good works. Yeah. Is it not? I mean, if you have that faith of Christ, then you are, you know, improving day by day and you're reflecting that faith in good works. Right. And, and th that is one. And second, uh, I don't think we can lose our salvation. If we are born again and with faith in Christ, we can't lose our salvation. Am I right in saying that? Uh, yes. Uh, you know, when you say you cannot lose your salvation, that's a huge subject by itself. Maybe we yeah. will. I wish you would look it up one day. <laughs> yeah, we will probably look at it one day. You know, the uh, the ass assurance of salvation. Right. In uh, my mind. I... Say that again, Suryamurthy. In my mind, yeah. I am convinced that we will not lose out the salvation. <laughs> we will not. But I am just reading through the text. Right. We will not lose salvation even if you are imperfect, right? Because in this lifetime, I don't think perfection is there. Let me just add one more thing just in case there is a uh, uh, misunderstanding. See, we have very clearly seen what we are obligated to in terms of living a Christian life. Now, all of these works does not save us. Please don't think that these works are saving you. By not indulging in the flesh, that's not saving you. That is what, like Anil said, that is only expressing your faith in Christ. But do I do it perfectly? I just, I cannot do it perfect. That is where I trust Christ. That Christ has done everything perfect. And it is in him I have my salvation. Not in, in my not indulging in the flesh. I just wanted to clarify that in case. Yes, Bertie, go ahead. Yes, in, in this matter, the Bible also mentions about false cries, false gospel, false spirit. Uh, I mean, uh, how do we take care of that? You know, uh, somebody, could, somebody could be living his whole Christian life following uh, or, you know, having faith in a false Christ. Even the devil has transformed himself to an angel of light. Therefore, it's no uh, big deal if his ministers also transform themselves into uh, ministers of righteousness whose end shall be according to their works. My point is, how do we guard ourselves against this false Christ, false gospel and false spirit? <laughs> All right. Uh... Well, uh, we, we looked at one false gospel in Galatians 5. What is the false gospel? Works. Salvation by works. That, that's what Paul is saying. And he's saying that's a false gospel. Right? Now, see, what you're really saying is, you know, how do we know people are all correct and, you know, will finally uh, be saved? Uh, what you're trying to say is, you know, something that only Christ knows. So if somebody is worshipping a false Christ, I, I mean to say, unless they specifically tell me what Christ you're following, uh, I would know, right? Uh, some people might think that, you know, people in, in, in a particular denomination or a particular church, they're all following the false Christ. I don't think any one of us can make that judgment, right? That judgment is only made by Christ because only he can see the heart. And so I don't think we should go to the point of trying to say who is saved and who is not saved and all of that stuff. You know, as much as we understand, as much as we know Christ and we know our salvation is in Christ, let's hang on to that. Uh, 
Uh, anyway, much more can be said about that, but uh, uh, anybody else have a thought on that? Well, again, I think one should examine it with the Bible like the Berians used to do. If there is some doubt whether this is false doctrine or uh, false prophet or whatever, go back to the Bible. Yeah, right. Uh, yeah, so, you know, I mean, uh, uh, growing, in, growing in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is something that I think is a uh, very good advice for all of us. Uh, we have to grow up from from childhood to adulthood, you know, uh, like the Apostle Paul says. So there is a need for us to learn, to be on guard. Uh, and uh, yes, uh, there are people who, you know, uh, worship Christ in a way that may not be right. But uh, let's, let's, you know, leave that judgment to the Holy Spirit and Christ. But once again, my focus today was, you know, to basically uh, bring home the point that Christians do have an obligation to live a certain way of life. You know? We have to express the faith in Christ in a particular way, not in any way which we like. Uh, and that way is not prescribed by the law. That way is prescribed by the Holy Spirit, Right. And Paul makes it abundantly clear. And I think uh, uh, even last time, I, I think it was Shanti who mentioned, uh, love is a, the very, very essence of it all, right? Uh, that is what is important, not the, not the ritual. All right, we got some more. Yes, Vanessa, go ahead. Okay, I wanted to know one question is that in the Bible, they tell us to love one another and to forgive one another. That's what the Bible teaches us, or God teaches us. Now, uh, loving a person or loving one another are different ways. We can show love in different ways. And one way is, of course, to forgive each other. Right. Now, by forgiving, of course, we find it difficult depending on uh, the matter of forgiving, whether it is a great matter or a petty matter or what kind of a forgiving. Okay, so we say that we can pray for the person who has harmed us, has done wrong to us. If we pray for that person, we are asking for forgiveness, okay? But supposing we pray for the person and the person does better than you, then, then automatically uh, the bad feeling is still there. So how can the forgiveness, the praying, the praying be forgiven when again, what, even if you pray every day for the persons who are doing wrong to you and still they are prospering and still you are feeling the hurt and the pain or still whatever is there, then where does the love come in? So don't you think that love and forgiveness is so hard, so difficult for us humans? Yeah, <laughs> okay. Uh, you mentioned, uh, you know, you're hurt because they are prospering. <laughs> 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 that shows that you probably don't love that person at all because you don't want the person to prosper. <laughs> I'm just, I'm just uh, reading into what you say. Uh, but yes, forgiveness is a very important aspect of the entire concept of, uh, of love. Uh, forgiveness can be expressed in various ways. One way is prayer, that you pray for that person, right? But forgiveness also can be reconciliation, where you go and speak to the person and uh, sort out the matter, right? If you're able to sort out the matter and, uh, and bring some sense of reconciliation if it is possible, right? Uh, live in peace with him. Do not take, uh, do not avenge your hurt, and do not take revenge on the person. So these are various ways of how forgiveness is expressed, and prayer can be one of those. But if you still have feelings that you're struggling with, now that may take time to go away. But as you do these things, those feelings will hopefully begin to transform into genuine feelings of love. 
I'm not saying that it can be done overnight. Uh, uh, sometimes it takes time to, you know, for healing to take place. Does that help, Vanessa? Yeah, it helps. But uh, see, like I have two friends also. They, they, their two children are not keeping in touch with them. They are praying for those two children. They are trying to talk to those two children. They say that the daughter-in-laws are not letting their children talk to them. Yeah. So, I mean, then how does this problem of whether the, the parents are forgiving the children, whether the children are forgiving the parents. So, I mean, it becomes a, a great issue over there. No, so forgiveness and love, even if the parents love the children, but then the supposing the in -law, the daughter in laws are not loving and so how how does that solve the problem? <laughs> Maybe you should send them for counseling. <laughs> <laughs> no, other than I that, try, I try to speak in some yeah. way to make things clear, but it, it yeah. becomes difficult. Yeah, mm. but you know what you say is also once again manifests what we have been discussing. The whole relational perspective is destroyed, right? And that is what we are trying to, I mean, uh, Paul is trying to address that the relational is so very important. And these aspects of forgiveness and uh, showing, expressing love through forgiveness is so vitally important. But unfortunately, uh, like we were discussing earlier with Surya Murthy's question, we are not perfect. We all struggle. There are feelings that are so strong where some people will not even respond to your uh, reaching out to them. So all of these happens. And uh, I don't know, I can only pray for God's mercy upon them. And God's, uh, you know, uh, what you say, intervention for transformation to take place. Uh, that's all we can do. And I think prayer is very helpful there. Yes. Yeah, but it's unfortunate. Okay. Yes, Franklin, go ahead. Sir, uh, I, I have one question for you, sir. There is, there is one text in the New Testament which says, study to show thyself approved, a workman rightly dividing the word of God. My question is, are we obligated to the written word of God? When you say approved, I mean, uh, yeah, so your question was, uh, are we obligated to the written word of God? Yes, are we obligated to the written word of God? Now, I don't understand your question. Uh, what do you mean by saying you're obligated to the written word? Sir, we said we are not obligated to the law, no? Yeah. Uh, but we, we are obligated to the living the living word of God. Yeah. So Christ <laughs> fills us with this love and we walk in his spirit. Okay. Then uh, what about the, the other components of the written word of God? See, this is where uh, we, we tend to take things out of context. You know? This is a, a classic case where we're taking take things out of context. Uh, the, 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 the written word of God says, greet each other with a holy kiss. You remember that? Mm -hmm. Now, if I don't do that, am I not obligated to the written word of God? Should we do that to be obligated to the written word of God? <laughs> Franklin, what do you think? <laughs> See, yes. that, you have to look at it in context. And when Paul says the sacrifices and uh, all the days and uh, all the rituals are not part of the new covenant, it is taken in context and we recognize that those things are not obligated upon us as Christians. So don't read the word literally, read it contextually, in context. Sometimes there is a literality to it. Sometimes the literal that that literality is in the within the context. So that is how I would explain. Anybody else have any thoughts on that? Okay. But well, time is slowly slipping away. I thought I would be bombarded by questions. Uh, <laughs> and, uh... Uncle, I have a question. Paul, go ahead. Yes. Um, uncle, I'm not sure what uh, Catholics actually believe in. Can you hear me, Uncle? I can yeah. hear you, but I, I didn't catch the first few words. Okay, I'm not. Uh, so I'm saying I don't know what actually Catholics believe in. But uh, I've, I've been told for a long time that they believe in a works-based salvation. Is it true? 
And if it isn't the case, why does it look like they have a lot of traditions that they hold on to? Okay. Oh boy, <laughs> those are questions. Uh, uh, they are not very easy to answer. But when you say, are they work based? Uh, it appears so. Uh, they are. They are doctrine. Uh, seem to seem to indicate. Once again, I am not an expert in Catholic doctrine, so I'm just giving you some thoughts that I have. Uh, their, their, their doctrine seem to indicate that if you don't belong to the Catholic Church, that is, they believe that salvation is only in the in the Catholic Church, uh, or if you don't, uh, you know, submit yourself to the Mass, uh, and if you, then there are something about venial sins. So I'm presuming. These are what makes it work-based. Now, I don't know if all Catholics subscribe to that, but the official doctrine seem to indicate that. And that's the reason why, you know, at the Reformation, uh, all of this was rejected. You also mentioned about some traditions. I'm not sure what traditions you're talking about, but uh, traditions are okay uh, as long as you don't think that those traditions are saving you. Our salvation is only in Christ. Your traditions are okay. For example, you know, I used to belong to the, uh, the uh, Jacobite Syrian church and a, a typical worship there is the priest dressing up in all this finery with candles burning, incense, you know. They, these are these traditions that have come along and I think the Eastern church still has that. Maybe the Catholic church too, I'm not sure. They are, I mean, they are just peripheral stuff. Uh, I don't, I'm not sure if they believe that unless you do that, you know, your uh, uh, salvation is compromised. I don't think so. So um, I'm not sure how to answer your question, but, but it depends on each Catholic, I presume. Okay. okay. Uh, but, uh, because uh, we, when we talk about Christianity, uh, lots of, I mean, friends and all, they say, but Catholics are not Christian. So that's always a question for me. Yes, yes. You know, it's vice versa. If we say Catholics are not Christians, Catholics say we are not Christians. Yes, yes, uncle. That's, so, that, that's the funny thing. You know, I was told by a Catholic that uh, my marriage is not valid because it was not solemnized by a Catholic priest. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm living in sin, according to this particular person. Uh, but how silly. Uh, but, you know, your husband is an expert in some of these things. So I'm sure he can answer your question better. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, yes. Yes. Now, just one observation: almost every religion in the world is works based. Yeah. Almost every religion that your your good works have to outweigh your bad works, and that involves a whole lot of rituals and all that. And I think uh, probably Catholicism also is part of that. Yeah. Yes, I think the uniqueness of uh, the true Christian faith, I think, separates itself completely from all of these because all of them are like work-based, right? Like you rightly said. Uh, and uh, grace-based grace is so very different. And uh, the Christian faith uh, helps us understand that, right? And uh, yeah, any other thoughts? Otherwise, uh, you know... Uh, May I... Sheila, yes, go ahead. Can you explain verse 15 once again, please? Uh, uh, Galatians 5.15? Yes, please. Okay. Uh, let me, I don't have it in my notes. Did I refer to that? I'm not sure. Um, Galatians 5.15. Okay, it says, but if you bite and devour one another, watch out, or you will be consumed by one another. Is that the right verse, Sheila? Yes. Okay. See, once again, Paul is showing that uh, they are not living by love, but they are living by the so-called, you know, uh, ritualistic law, which does not deal with all of them. Notice it says, if you bite and devour one another, Watch out. In other words, there is a relational problem there. 
there is hatred, there is dissension, there is fighting, infighting, there is all kinds of, and what Paul is saying is, you are, you people are stupid thinking about circumcision being necessary while you are breaking God's law in every form and fashion by, by being so hateful towards each other. That's what Paul is trying to say. And he is saying, if you carry on like this, you will be destroyed by one another. Yeah. Right? Does that help, Ashila? Uh, yes. When I read consumed, I thought they eat, eat each other up. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's talking of being basically being destroyed. Metaphorically. <laughs> <laughs> okay, then let's bring this to a close because... Uh, we basically overshot time, but uh, I hope that I put some things in perspective. Let me just end by saying that, you know, uh, uh, that last part that I had uh, mentioned, love your enemies. I mean, uh, if you want something hard, <laughs> uh, can you, I mean, can you, can we do that perfectly and bringing back, bringing that back to what Surimurti asked, can we be perfect by trying to live by that standard that Jesus Christ left for us, where we can say, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. That's tough, very tough. And what I believe is, when uh, the Apostle Paul says, such will not inherit the kingdom of God, what I believe is, God will help us overcome this. You see, we are now imperfect, but God, Jesus, will help us overcome all of this, and he will help us to enter the kingdom, having been cleansed of all of this. That's how I look at it. And that's what I ask for in my prayer every day. Lord, cleanse me so that I can enter in your perfect kingdom. Because I still carry this baggage. So I can end with that. Right. And uh, Rekha, would you like to close in prayer for us? Thank you. <laughs> Eternal Father, Almighty God, we are so grateful that you're opening our minds and our hearts to your great truth. We still sin and make mistakes. But Father, you are, a, you are a forgiving God, you are a merciful God, and we are truly, truly blessed to be able to meet and be able to be faithful to you and believe in you in everything. So Father, please open our hearts and minds. Father, we ask your blessing on all those who are suffering at this time. Please protect and guide them and help them to be healed. And Father, we really wish the very best for all our people the world over so that we can learn and be faithful to you in everything. Thank you, Father, for everything. And we ask all this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much for your participation. God bless you all.